please welcome 2014 Full Sail Hall of Fame inductee to Full Sail University, Larry Katz. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Dave Franco. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm very excited as well because um, this is a well-deserved honor and, and a pleasure to have you here. You guys are in for a quite a treat as you saw Larry's reel here. And Larry, if you can just really get us started and tell us how you got into this business. And you kind of have a unique path that we don't see a lot, especially with your DGA affiliation. Born and raised in Miami, Florida. That's right. Um, full sale graduate in 2000. And from there, um, take us on your journey. Well, I'll give you guys a little bit of background. So I actually didn't come to full sale right out of high school. I kind of went to a more traditional college, kind of the thing you're supposed to do. You graduate from high school and then you go right to undergrad. I went to University of Florida and studied business and it was not for me at all, but I kind of you know, stumbled and bumbled through it because I realized it was important to get that degree and finish, but it was never you know, what I wanted to do. It wasn't fulfilling for me. And um, you know, I was just kind of trying to get through it. So after uh, I graduated from undergrad, I actually got a really cool job as a sailing and windsurfing instructor at Club Med. And so I spent the next you know, four or five years traveling all over beautiful Caribbean destinations and teaching sailing and windsurfing. But the hours were very long at that job and I was on my feet a lot. And so I started to realize that I was really happier when I was stimulated and had something to do all the time. So um, after that, I was never gonna be able to sit in an office and have a regular job. And I had a really good friend of mine who was here at Full Sail uh, doing the recording um, program. And he told me that I should check it out. He thought it would be something that I was into because I was always enjoying movies and filmmaking. So I came and checked it out. And uh, I really was impressed with what I saw. At that time, it was just a one-year program. And that was good for me because I'd already gone to undergrad. And so that worked out well. And I came and um, started studying film production. And I loved it. And you know, unlike undergrad, where I was bored and barely went to class and couldn't even you know, muster the energy to study or anything, here now, when I started studying film production, I, I started to realize, all right, this is something I could really sink my teeth into. And I sat in the front of every class. And I graduated second in my class and loved it. There were very small classes at that time. There was only 21 people in my graduating class. So it was a little bit of a different ball game. But, um, the, the thing that really, that really worked for me was that we moved around of, in every position on the film crew, and so I was able to experience what every position was. And um, you know, everybody was kind of going out for director or producer, and I was a little bit older you know, at that time, and I had a little bit more of a more pragmatic approach to it. I realized that what my goal was, it was to get on the film sets of the movies that I like to watch. Now, there are people that are directors and they're artistic and they have a vision and they, you need to be a director. And I understand that, you know, that's not me. My, again, my goal was to get on the film sets and work on the film sets. If you have a creative vision and you know, it's, it's a very clear vision, then I would encourage you to, to go be a director or you know, a writer, or if you, if you have that creative fire burning inside of you, then you should pursue it. But you have to figure out what your goals are. I mean, you know, if you look at the credits of a movie, there's one director, but there's a lot of other names that go by. And those jobs are still very hard to get, but it's easier and, you know, it's a little bit more doable. So you have to make that decision. Again, I'm not discouraging you. If you are, you know, have that burning desire inside of you to be a director, then you should pursue it. If you want to work on movies and, you know, you could be a little bit more pragmatic about it. And so even though my script got selected for final film project, and normally that's the person that goes out for director. Even though the, my script got picked, I still went out for assistant director because I saw, all right, this is a job that is gonna work for me. I get to be there for every single shot of the film. They don't do one shot unless the assistant director is standing there saying rolling. So that you know, really was the things that kind of led me to want to be an assistant director. And it's just so much uh, logistics and your, your brain is always stimulated. So these are the things that really appeal to me about it. But I did uh, 
like I said, I did get picked for, can I put a picture up for my computer, please, guys? I did get picked for a final project, and uh, that's my, me and my mom and dad outside the Enzion for final film project. And um, I was the AD, like I said, on there. And then after graduation, I hung around in um, Orlando for a little while. Some of my uh, former classmates were getting together resources to put films together. So I worked actually professionally as an AD, uh, the first couple of movies here. And that's actually, this one's actually my uh, first rap beer ever here in Orlando. <laughs> And I could tell you guys uh, one very important thing that I learned on this film that was called uh, Reaction. We went to shoot um, in downtown Winter Garden, started early in the morning, and it rained. I mean, dumped. And I got soaking wet first thing in the morning. And that was it. I was stuck, stuck, soaked. And 14 hours later, when we finally wrapped, my shoes were just sponges and I hadn't even taken them off all day and I took them off and my feet were white, unrecognizable, pruney, horrifying zombie feet. So anyway, <laughs> the point of that story is get rain gear if you're gonna work in film production. You need to have rain gear. There are these overshoes called Neos that slip right over your shoes and zip up. Write that down, get yourself some Neos if you're gonna work in film production because if you get stuck out in the rain then you're boned if you're not prepared for it. What was this production, Larry? Uh, that one was called Reaction. It was just a local, uh, a local production here in town. How long were you in Central Florida? After Full Sail, um, I graduated in June, and by October, I had decided to go ahead and make the move to LA. I thought, I figured uh, you know, it was time to, to pull the trigger and go ahead and do it, because that's where it's all happening. I mean, you know, you have film production, happening in um, different places, but LA, New York, and then everywhere else is kind of, you know, it's, it's evening out a little bit now with runaway production and the tax credits and stuff, but LA was really the place to do it. So um, everybody, oh, really sad that my pictures don't fit on the screen exactly, but anyway, everyone wants to know how I did it. You guys know what that prop is from this, on this picture? Anyway, Young Frankenstein, great movie. Yeah. Mel Brooks, you guys should see it if you haven't seen it. But anybody, but everybody wants to know how I did it. I'm gonna tell you guys my path to where I am today. And it's gonna be different for everybody. Not everybody has the same exact path. You're gonna have different opportunities and different ways that you can go about it. And I'll discuss a little bit of that. But here's what I did. So after I graduated, worked on a couple of movies here, decided to pull the trigger, moved to LA. And then what you need to do is call everybody that you know. Friends, family, do you know anybody in film production? Do you know anybody that can help me out? People hire who they know. You can send out cold resumes, you know, anything that you can do to get yourself known. But to be honest with you, I've never, ever hired anybody ever from a cold resume. And the production office of the films that I work on, we have a stack of PA resumes like that that people just send in. You know, it doesn't hurt to send those out, I guess. But to be frank with you guys, to be franco with you guys, <laughs> I've never, ever hired anybody from a cold resume. So. What I did was I called everybody that I knew and I started getting smaller jobs. And then um, what finally, uh, the first break I got was my stepsister that I was living with in LA's former roommates, former friends, boyfriend, knew somebody that was working on this movie, How High, which was the yeah. Method Man and Red Man. Yeah, you guys know. Yeah. The finest urban stoner movie of 2001. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got a job in the production office. This is not exactly what I wanted to do. However, you know, I got my foot in the door, finally. Bam, jammed my foot in the door. And as it turns out, that was a really valuable experience because assistant directors work very closely with the production office. Hall of Famer Steve Canis, who's gonna be here later this week, uh, we're doing a panel together on Thursday. He, um, he's a production coordinator. He works in the production office. And it's a really vital job. And we work very closely together with the, with the production office and the ADs. So it was a really good experience for me to work in the office and learn exactly you know, what they were doing so that later when I became an AD, I was able to you know, have a synergistic relationship with those guys. But a lot of things that happen in the office include the creation of sides. You guys know what that is? Every day on a film set, you're gonna take the day's script pages and you're gonna shrink them down 65% on, uh, on your photocopier for you guys that are gonna make sides. 
and you take this, the day's call sheet and you miniaturize that and you make a little booklet of the day's work. And so this happens in the production office the night before or the morning of, of shooting. And then these sides are distributed on set to all the actors and everybody on the crew so that everybody can follow along and everybody knows what's happening. They also make a really awesome place to write stuff down, which is very important for you guys to do, to write everything down. Anything that somebody tells you, write it down. Just the physical act of writing it down kind of imprints it on your brain. So write everything down so you don't forget stuff because you're gonna have people telling you stuff all day. So what you wanna do is um, make sure you write everything down and your sides are a really good place to do that. These are from this TV show called The Unit with uh, Dennis Haysbert from 2007. And then if you really have a lot of time in the production office and it's April Fool's Day, you can continue to shrink the sides down <laughs> and hand them out as a joke to all the actors. So when you work in the production office, you will find that you might have some free time and these actually are legible sides from the television show Seventh Heaven that I distributed as an April Fool's Day joke. <laughs> That's right. You, you sh this, this job is supposed to be fun, right? So you, you make sure you have fun every day. If you're not having fun, then what are you doing standing in the rain with wrinkly white feet for 18 hours a day? You could definitely get an easier job working in an office. So you need to like look around and am I having fun? If not, then you know, it's not gonna be for you. So um, what did I learn from this, this job in this production office? Even if it's not your dream job, you have to like bring your best and you be early and be happy and have the best attitude because you don't know who's watching, who's in that office that might be able to hire you for your next job. And while I was in that production office, the ADs came in to start their preparation and I was able to learn some stuff from them. And so no matter what the job is, if you get your foot in the door, you have to you know, bring your best, even if it's not exactly what you wanna do. So I kind of got pigeonholed in the production office there for a minute after How High and I worked on Catch Me If You Can, which was great. If you work in the office, uh, oftentimes your first job is gonna be as a runner, so you are going to set a lot. So I got to go to the set of Catch Me If You Can and be on set with Steven Spielberg, even then kind of early in my career, which was extremely exciting. So then I got a, a short job on Scorpion King um, in the office also. Not what I wanted to do. I needed to start saying no to those jobs, but it was towards the end of the production, so I got to go to the rap party, which was pretty fun. Real quick, Larry, too, what were some of the j other jobs that you were, people were searching for you and you were kind of deciding and almost formulating the path that you wanted to go to? Well, I was, I was pretty dead set on, on um, being an AD, so I was pretty focused on that. I mean, oftentimes the, 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 the road to that is getting jobs as a set PA, not as an office PA, but those set PA jobs are very coveted and they're political oftentimes. So those are hard to get if you don't know anybody and I didn't know anybody. So I wanted the PA jobs and um, beyond that, what I was pursuing was the DGA training program. And so anybody that is serious about being a assistant director, you should check that out. Training program, trainingplan.org is the website. And I learned about that actually while I was still a student at Full Sail and so I applied the first time when I was still a student. They have an application process every year and it's this whole um, testing and essays and all this stuff. So I applied for that while I was still a student at Full Sail and took, at my own expense, flew to Chicago in December and took this test and you know, nine inches of snow and went into uh, an auditorium and took this written test. And um, I didn't get in, but you know, this training program is such a golden ticket to the top of this particular job that uh, I, want, I wanted to continue to pursue it and people apply for it year after year. So I applied, you know, after I moved to LA, got the jobs working as a office PA, I, would, I continued to apply for the DGA training program. And so um, in the meantime, there are other avenues to, be, to getting into Director's Guild and all assistant directors are in the Director's Guild. Once you, once you, you know, get to that level in the union, you have to join and become a union assistant director. So there's a couple other avenues to do that. So the training program is really the biggest hookup, but it's super competitive and, you know, they accept maybe 15 or 20 people a year out of a couple thousand applicants. So it's a long shot and I was really lucky. I mean, that really defined my whole career getting into that. But there are a couple of different avenues. Like I mentioned, uh, being a SEP PA is a very popular way to get in. So if you get the job as a set PA, 
then you begin to accumulate days and you, you keep your pay stubs and your call sheets and it's a certain number of days that you have to get and then you're able to move in to the guild as a third area AD. So you're not allowed to work in LA, but you can work everywhere else. Everywhere else. And it's not easy. This is probably a, a five to seven year process of being entry level and making minimal pay. And you know, you're absolutely the lowest person on the totem pole. And it's, uh, it's not easy. But that's a way that many ADs get in the union through the PA route. If you go, if you're interested in that, you can check with the director's guild, call their contract department, and they can tell you what the process is. And, but but that's, a, that's a hard road. The advantage is you're getting experience working on huge sets. And um, it's exciting and you're meeting people, but it's definitely hard to transition even once you get the, the number of days that you need. Now, the other way to get in is being a non-union AD. And so there's a very specific um, requirements for these days to count towards your membership in the, in the guild. But that's what I was doing because it's a lot shorter uh, period of time than the PA route. So wh while I was applying for the training program, I continued to work as a non-union AD. So I wasn't making any money. I was working for pizza and credit, but these days were counting and I was starting to build towards being a, an assistant director. And it also appealed to me because I was practicing what I wanted to be. So if you're a PA for seven years, then you're not really getting the AD work. You're, you're getting some of it, some of it's getting delegated to you, but as a non-union AD, you're doing what you're gonna be. And I think that's important. That was good advice that I got you know, from actually one of the ADs on how high. He said, you know, do what you wanna be. You wanna be a director, then you should be directing stuff, whatever it is. If you wanna be a grip, be a grip. Turn down other things and work as a grip wherever you can, on other student projects, anywhere you can volunteer, and you know, until you start getting recognized and people start to hire you. So um, you know, do what you wanna be. So there are uh, resources for finding these non-union jobs. I don't know what they are anymore. There was this website called Mandy.com when I was lurking and there was Backstage West. Now there's probably many more uh, resources, but to be honest with you, I don't know what they are, but you need to seek those out. Seek, seek out where they list non-union jobs that you can get your experience on. So um, that's, that's how I started to build my experience. And then finally, after, uh, three times applying, I got into the DGA training program in 2002. And to be honest with you guys, I've never had to send out another resume since then. In the training program, there's an administrator and every 50 days you're placed on a film or TV set and you are the trainee. You have a, you know, I'll, I'll go over in a little bit about, you know, what everybody does along the, the rungs of the ladder, but every 50 days you're, you know, you're placed on a new show. So it takes 400 days of uh, on-the-job training until you are graduated, but within that time, every 50 days, you're meeting a whole new crew of people, and that's now become my network of people that I work with, and um, so it's an amazing hookup, the training program, if you can get in. And I encourage you guys to apply for that if you are serious about being assistant directors, and anybody that gets um, past the first couple phases and in, into the interview, portion of it, then you can definitely contact me and I can help you uh, with the interviews and all that stuff. Every year I get a call from a couple people that want the inside scoop on what goes on with the interviews. And I'm happy to do that because, you know, as an AD, you, want, you need to be dialed in. So this is not cheating, this is being prepared. When I came in, uh, I did the same thing. When I was applying, I found a guy who had gone through it and I picked his brain. And so when I got in front of the board of directors of the Directors Guild and I was expecting the things that they were gonna ask me. They say, wow, you're pretty dialed in. How do you, did you, did you like check with somebody? I said, yeah, I did. I didn't, and that's not cheating, you know, I'm doing my research, I'm doing my homework. As an AD, you need to know everything about everything, no matter, you know, how you get that information. So um, again, if you, if you do get to that level, feel free to give me a call. What's, what's that interview process like a little bit? I know oh, that Jess, a, it's a long process on that, but can you give two, us a glimpse? Well, they might have changed it by now, but there's a, there's a, um, a group interview, and you, you're, in, you're in a group of other candidates surrounded by proctors from the Directors Guild that are scribbling notes, and they never ask you one question about film production. <laughs> they ask you these, uh, it's, it's kind of prioritizing questions, you know, if, they, if, you're, uh, if you're working on an oil rig and they give you a, a bunch of scenarios, somebody gets injured and somebody, uh, some other thing happens, you know, what, what are the order that you're gonna tackle these things? Because you always have to prioritize on a film set, like I have all these things I need to do, but what's really the most important thing? 
And so they ask you to prioritize things. And what I can tell you about that group interview, the, the great advice I got is that they're not looking for Mr. Bossy Know-It-All or Miss Bossy Know-It-All. Like, hey, guys, we're gonna do what I say. You know, being part of production is being collaborative. And so they're looking for people that can keep moving forward in a collaborative way. So what I did was I was the guy that was watching the clock because that's what ADs do anyway. So we have all these people that are, you know, trying to have the best ideas and, you know, be the loudest. And I'm saying, hey guys, we got five minutes to get to this, to get this solution. So let's go ahead and stop arguing and figure it out. And then the people around, the, the proctors around the room start scribbling when I said that. And I knew that I said the right thing. So <laughs> it's really, you know, they, they're not, they don't want somebody that's like a shrinking violet. They don't want a know-it-all. What you're supposed to do, you know, what an AD does is you collaborate with every department on the film set and keep moving forward, you know, and it's all about time because that's, you know, really the resource that we don't have a lot of on a film set. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting take, and and we always think of the first ads, you know, when we're kids or start film school, we know that we're, we're given these like stereotypes a little bit in in certain ways. But that's that's great advice. Thanks for sharing that. No worries. So yeah. now um, I'd like to show you guys actually the unabridged list of every project that I have worked on since 2002 when I got into the uh, DGA training program. So, yep, as a trainee, those, and then as a second AD, all that stuff. Now, um, I didn't actually plan it this way, but as my, as my career worked out, I've done a lot of short parts on movies. I've done very few movies from beginning to end. I've done a lot of reshoots, because a lot of times what will happen on these big budget movies is they'll, they'll, they'll make the whole movie, they'll edit it, and then they'll, the director will say, you know, what we really need is this one scene to really tie everything together. And because there's so much money at stake and they have so much riding on these films, the producers will say, okay, if we really need that connective part to really make this work, then let's get everybody back together. We'll get all the actors back that are working on other movies that have beards now that didn't have beards, who gain weight that, you know, whatever, get all the costumes out of storage and they get the whole gang back together. And oftentimes the assistant directors that worked on that part of the movie aren't available, and so they'll have a different crew. And so as it turned out, I did a lot of short stints and also a lot of second units, which are action and stunt units, which I didn't plan, but it, it, was actually, it actually turned out pretty cool. So um, I, I like moving around a lot and doing a lot of different things. You can plan your career and work on a TV series for 10 years, and that's it. You work on that one show. You know, I worked as a, as a, a trainee on CSI in 2002, and they're still, the, the same ADs are there now, you know, from then, you know, so that's like normal, same place they go every day, and a more of a, a controlled career, you know. I really enjoyed the moving around, so you can, you can kind of sometimes steer your career in one way or the other. Some people want that more normal, you know, know where they're going every day kind of career, if you have a family or something, but I really enjoyed moving around a lot. So... What does an AD do? So I asked my boss this question, and this is what we came up with. And so this is really what the first AD is concerned about. So the AD department is the first AD, the key second AD, the second second AD, and then the production assistants. And the trainee, not all shows have a trainee, but if there's a trainee, then he or she fits there underneath the second second assistant director, okay? And then you have all the PAs. And this is the, this is the, the AD team. So whatever part of that team you're on, you need to be thinking about what the person ahead of you is worried about. Because first of all, you wanna be promoted at some point. And second of all, you wanna have their back. So you're not, if you're a PA, you're not just worried about your stuff. You wanna know what the second second assistant director is worried about and how can I help them? So what this list is here is, really what the first assistant director is concerned about. So I'm just gonna go over it really quickly. So here's what ADs do. We take the script and create a schedule based on the budget, keeping in mind actors and local and location availability. So I wanna show you guys this uh, program called Movie Magic Scheduling. And this is really like the, the go-to program for um, ADs. And you know, if you wanna do it, you might wanna think about downloading this program. It's available online. And uh, if you wanna be an AD, this is absolutely industry standard. So here's the script from the part of uh, Little Fuckers that I worked on. And a lot of times you'll see as you work on bigger and bigger movies, you get 
information that's watermarked on every page with your name on it. So if this gets on the internet, then there's really no question, even if it's page 27, where it came from. So what assistant directors do is we take the script scene by scene and look at every element in every scene. You know, where, which actor is in it? What props are in it? What location is in it? And so this first page here is a breakdown sheet. And if you can see, it's got the actors on it, Bernie Fucker. It's got all the extras. It's got whatever stunt guys, vehicles, props. These are all the elements that are in every scene of every script. We call them elements. And they're called elements also in the program. So go through the script, scene by scene, and you make one of these breakdown sheets for every single scene. And then you have a schedule in continuity from scene one to the last scene based on every scene and all the elements. So then we have this thing called the strip board. And the strip board, each one of these strips is one of those breakdown sheets. And so each one of these strips represents a scene in the script. So now I'm looking at this script in continuity and I know that scene one takes place in the Spanish open square and maybe scene 92 takes place in the Spanish open square. So we're gonna shoot those on the, same, on the same day. It doesn't make any sense to go unload the trucks, light this whole set, put everything there, put you know, base camp, build all this stuff, shoot that, and then wrap it up, leave, load the trucks up, and then come back some other day. So that's really like the, the most basic way that we're gonna break down the script by location. One, you know, once you're there, you wanna shoot everything that takes place there. Then you break it down further by day or night, okay? You wanna shoot all the day stuff at, you know, during the day and all the night stuff, you wanna put it all together at night because we have the turnarounds. You can't shoot day and night. You have to, once you're on nights, you can't switch back to shooting days until you give everybody a break, a rest. So you wanna, that's the kind of the second way we break it down by day and night. And then, okay, Dustin Hoffman's not available next Wednesday and you know, uh, De Niro's not available Thursday. So there's a lot of different factors that go into breaking down a script into a logical, you know, cogent and economical schedule. You know, and we want to, you know, it's got to, it's, it's got to be budget based also the way that we make the schedule. You know, you know, there's a certain number of days that you can, that you can budget. And so what an AD really needs to do is be able to look at a scene and tell you how long it's going to take to shoot that just by reading it. So that's a skill that ADs need to develop. And then once it's on this paper, as, uh, as Matthew says here, we are responsible for keeping the shooting company to that schedule. So... I've made, you know, the first AD has made the schedule in prep and now it's on the day. And, the, and so as the AD, I've said, okay, we can complete scene 37 today. So I better make sure that happens because I said that we could do it. So now on set during production, now you have the AD as the driving force on the set that's keeping us on that schedule. There can never be any downtime. Every moment has to be, you know, accounted for. If, if we have a second to rest and we're rehearsing something else or looking at something, you know, you're always thinking about what you can do to, to squeeze everything in that, in that time. So in keeping the shooting company to that schedule, we're running the set with a firm hand. So, you know, some ADs are screamers because they want to keep that, that schedule. Other ADs like myself are more laid back and find that we can keep the, the crew on schedule without, you know, being angry and screaming. But there's different, there's different ways to, to get to skin that cat. So another way that we uh, keep things moving is to distribute information. So that comes in the form of schedules, call sheets, uh, any, there's no hiding information. We want everybody to know everything so that everybody knows what's coming. I don't ever want somebody to say, well, I didn't know we were doing that. Well, yeah, you did. I gave you five schedules that said that, a call sheet, you know, a memo. So we're, we're really raining information down on everybody all the time. And here's where we really toe the line because it's not just about keeping the company to that schedule. As an assistant director, I work for the director, right? The creative force behind this movie. And it's not my only job to say that, see that we get from A to B and that the actors vomit these words out and that you know, we get it on schedule. I also have to create an environment for this director to be able to be artistic to work with his actors to make the shot look the way that he, that he or she wants to make it look. So it's, a, it's an interesting tightrope act. You're, 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 you're towing the line between creative and budget. You're the, 
Here, a couple lines down, we represent the director in helping create his vision and the producer in a financial sense. So it's really a tug of war. You might have the production manager yelling at you, why are we still in the barn? We should have moved on to the movie theater 20 minutes ago. But you, know, you have the director, you know, what am I gonna tell you know, uh, Martin Scorsese, stop talking to Leo. We have to go to the movie theater set. You know? <laughs> they, these, these are creative people and these are artists that have to have their time. But the more prepared you are going in, then you allow that time to these, uh, to these artistic people. Now, really the most important thing, I think, is that we are responsible for the safety of the cast and crew. So now we're trying to move fast, we're trying to create a, a creative atmosphere, but at the same time, everything has to be safe, like top priority. So every stunt, every cable crossing, every, you know, uh, C-stand that arm that's sticking out that doesn't have a tennis ball on the end of it, we're watching that too. The safety of the set is on our hands. Any accident, it comes down on the assistant director. And so you wanna be a manager, you're responsible now for that stuff. So really that should be at the top, I think. We're responsible for the safety of the cast and crew. So as a crew member, if you see anything unsafe, you need to report it to the ADs and the ADs are the one that, ones that can Okay, we're stopping until we resolve this because nobody's getting hurt. It's not worth it, you know? We have to stay on schedule, we have to be creative, but it's not worth it if somebody gets hurt. So I think that's a really important one. Um, ADs set the background action, which makes it appear that the actors are performing in real life situations. I'll get much more into that later, but all the extras, you know, are, the, are choreographed by the ADs, and that could be hundreds or thousands of people that we're responsible for, uh, you know, uh, creating the background. And then uh, the last thing, we are the voice of the set. If you guys ever visit a film set and you hear somebody, it's gonna be the AD. The AD is the one that says roll sound, the AD is the one oftentimes that says action and cut. If you know, the director's back at the monitors, the camera might be far away, and so the AD is the one that says action and cut a lot of times. So if you go to a film set and you hear a voice, oftentimes that's gonna be the AD. Um, let's see. So I wanna talk to you guys a little bit about like the reality of day to day, just so you know, because you think you wanna have this job and you're driven and you love it and um, you're having a great time and it should be fun and maybe you know this is what you're supposed to do with your life, but I just wanna tell you guys what it's really like. And again, I would pinch myself every day that I was on every set I've ever been on and I can't believe that this is my job. But the reality is, especially as an AD in production, you're the first one on set in the morning. So that means a typical start will be 7 a.m. for a crew call, just throwing it out there. So that means um, on just a regular show, uh, uh, not a special effects show or mutants, which take hours and hours to get ready. So if we have crew call at seven o'clock, uh, we're gonna bring in our first uh, female actresses usually at 5.30. So I'm there at 5.18. Can you give yourself a pre-call? And I have to be there to make sure that hair and makeup get in, to make sure that their, their trailer's open, to make sure that catering's set up, everything's set up. That's all on me. I'm ready to make that phone call if something's not there. Um, so it's early, ridiculously early. I mean, still, my alarm clock goes off in the four o'clock zone. That's ugly. And it, and it happens all the time. And it's not easy for that four something alarm to go off. So um, now we've gotten everybody ready and we're gonna start our day. We're shooting seven o'clock crew call. We eat six hours in, so lunch is at one. And then typically we're gonna wrap uh, maybe at 8.30, best case scenario. And now ADs are also the last ones out. So, okay guys, that's a wrap. Doesn't mean I get in my car and drive home. It's a wrap means I'm signing out the actors, first of all. And now if we're on location, I'm waiting for electrician number nine to wrap every piece of cable so that I can get their out time and get the production report. And if somebody gets injured at the end of the day, the ADs have to be there to document that, to make sure every, everybody is, you know, gets the care that they need. So we're talking best case scenario, 14 hour day, you know, often 15, 16, 17, 19 hours. I've had 21 hour days. That's no joke. That's a legit amount of time. There is, you know, there's rare instances, shows that I've worked on that have been really easy or shorter hours, but, you know, count on 14 or 15 hours every day. And now, uh, you know, now it's 10, 1030, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to go to sleep, and that's going to be five to six hours of sleep. 
and I'm waking up the next morning at four, whatever, to do it over again. So um, I want to, and again, if, if it's a labor of love, it's, to me, this is better than waking up and going and sitting in a cubicle for eight hours and then going home. So, uh, but it's not for everybody. But I do want to talk to you guys for a minute about attitude. You've heard, if you don't control your attitude, your attitude controls you. You've heard that before. But I want to like really kind of quantify that in the, the, the best adjustment I ever made. You know, you have people that are like, oh, I'm not a morning person. And they wake up and they're like, oh, I'm not a morning person. I'm not a morning person. Uh, there's no such thing, I don't think, as a morning person. <laughs> so I made the decision when I went to Full Sail. And Full Sail, great, great practice for the industry to have 24-hour labs, to wake up at 1 a.m. or to wake up at 5 a.m. That is so real world. And I made the decision in my own brain then that I would wake up at whatever time my alarm clock went, out, went off and just jump out of bed and go and not mope and not say, uh, and you know, not get, to, not get to the set and be mopey and tired. This is, a, this is not a, a physical, this is a mental thing. You can tell yourself, I'm not gonna be that person and just go. And if you're you know, on set and ready to go and ready to answer questions, then you have the attitude that people are gonna be drawn to and that people are gonna wanna hire. So um, I think that that's the most important adjustment that I made to my attitude was this whole morning person thing. Like, I don't think there's any such thing. So, um, you know, people don't hire me because I can type really fast. You know, everybody knows how to do the job once you get to a certain level. But if you're working 18 or 19 hours a day, it's like, who do you want to hang out with for 18 hours a day? So uh, I would encourage you guys to, whenever your alarm clock goes off, make that mental adjustment to just get up, put your feet on the ground and go. I mean, you don't have to, I don't even hit snooze anymore. I just go. I mean, I expect it's going to go off and that's it. If, I'm, if, I'm, if it feels terrible and I hate it, then get another job. You can definitely make that adjustment in your own brain. I mean, I want to encourage you guys to do that. So... Um, let me just uh, talk to you guys a little bit about the, uh, the steps to move up the chain. So your first job is going to be as a production assistant, probably. And so what do production assistants do? They do lockups. So you know what that is. You, you know, we're going to set the frame of our shot. And then the ADs are going to tell you, okay, I need a right lockup over here by the stairs. And I need another lockup over there by those cars. And then I need a lockup by craft service. So lockups can mean you're not letting people walk through the shot. And lockups are also for noise because you have a guy with this giant microphone with this giant thing on the end of the stick and he hears everything. So you got to make everybody be quiet once the assistant director calls a shot. Oh, that reminds me. I want to tell you guys exactly how to call a shot properly. Because I didn't know. When I was the AD on my uh, student film, I wasn't exactly sure. So here's what an AD will say. So um, at the beginning of a, of a rehearsal or a shot, I'm going to get on my walkie-talkie. I'm going to say, okay, guys, rehearsal's up. When I say that on my walkie-talkie, you guys have your walkies, and I want to hear for throughout the set, wherever you're standing on your lockups or craft service or by the bathroom or whatever, whatever comes in your ear comes out of your mouth like a parrot. So I'm going to say, okay, guys, rehearsal up. I want to hear 10 PAs. Rehearsal's up, yelling it out. Or picture's up, guys. Here we go. Picture. If I say picture's up, that lets hair and makeup know that they have to come in and do their final looks. If I say rehearsal's up, that lets everybody know to stop working and be quiet because we're going to give the director and the actors some time. So what the proper way to call the shot. Okay, guys, picture's up. Very quiet, please. Let's lock it up. And let's roll sound. When I say roll sound, all my PAs, wherever they are, rolling. I want to hear it. I don't care if you're 50 miles away from set and there's nobody around you but a lizard. I want you guys to say rolling. <laughs> you guys are there to echo my calls. Rolling, I want to hear it rolling. all over the place. So there's, so there's, you don't say roll camera, you don't say roll sound, you don't say, okay guys, let's roll it. The real, the real way that we do it, it's not written in any books. Pictures <laughs> up, quiet on the set. Maybe let's go on a bell. If you're on stage, you'll say let's go on a bell. The sound guy will put the bell on and the light goes on outside the stage. And then all you say is roll sound or just rolling or let's roll, that's it. And then the, uh, the sound guy will say speed, the camera doesn't, you don't have to tell the camera to roll. They're watching the sound guy, they'll roll it. I said, roll camera a couple times and the camera guy looked at me like, why are you telling me that? So all you do is say roll sound. The sound guy says speed, they'll slate it, they'll do the shot and that's it. So that's the proper way to call out a shot for you guys that are gonna be ADs on your uh, student projects. And everybody is there to echo those uh, roles. 
So as a PA, I want to show you guys this, uh, this paper that my, my boss and I, Matthew, put together just as kind of like guidelines for the way that we like people to work on our sets. Um, second, then, and this is for all the, the, the people that are on our team. Second AD carries two radios. So, you know, there's 16 channels on that walkie-talkie, right? And channel one is for production. And you want to keep any conversation on channel one down to like two or three words, especially if you're just a new PA on, you know, just getting into it. You should be, have minimal stuff that you're saying on that walkie. And then if you ever want to have a longer conversation, then you say, hey, let's go to channel two. Channel two is an open channel, and that's where you're going to have your longer conversations. But it's not a private conversation. Every time you say, hey, guys, let's go to channel two, everybody changes to channel two to hear what you're going to say. So don't think that you're going to have privacy. <laughs> but what you are doing is you're clearing channel one for the AD to make important, you know, important calls. So you never want to have, say anything more than two or three words on channel one. Right, even if, right exactly. <laughs> Somebody, if somebody calls your name, you say, you know, go for Larry or Franco here or whatever. And then if it's more than a one second thing, let's go to channel two. Switching, go to channel two. And then you have your conversation. So why does he say he wants uh, the second AD to carry two radios? So I'm the second AD. Everything comes through me. Everything comes through me. So if I'm on channel two talking to you about why, you know, the lizard uh, didn't be quiet on the last shot, then the first AD is on channel one saying, hey, Larry. Larry, 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 and I can't hear him. So uh, a lot of times on big film sets, you will see ADs and PAs have two walkie-talkies. So I will have my one walkie-talkie always on channel one, and then if somebody wants to talk to me, I'll take my other walkie-talkie, go to channel two. But I still have channel one in my ear so that when Matthew or whoever the AD is calls me, I can answer right away. So that's why it says that. <clears throat> Distribution of sides, we already talked about what those are. So you want to hand these out to everybody on the set. <laughs> and um, you get those sides, you read them. I mean, you, you remember, you want to know, always know the person above you is up to and how to help them. So it's really important as you're on a film set that you know what's going on during the day. You have a call sheet. It says exactly what the plan is. It says exactly when other actors are arriving. So you can be very valuable and make yourself you know, known as somebody that knows what's up. If you read those sides, you know what's coming, and you can anticipate what's going to happen next. So you want to read your sides and know what's going on. Um, respond on the radio if something is asked for. Very, very important. There's nothing more frustrating than me getting on the radio and saying, hey, guys, does anybody have eyes on Franco? Crickets. What I want to hear is looking, checking. Okay, I don't have eyes on Franco, but I heard you, and I'm looking. So that's a one-word answer. Again, you're not going to say a long diatribe on Channel 1, well, I was saw Franco an hour ago, and he was over by the bathroom, and he was wearing a green shirt, but then I didn't see him, and he went to grab service. No, looking, checking, or yeah, I got him. He's here. He's over here, and say where he is. Um, keeping it quiet on set. I mean, you, so you're brand new, super green PA, just off the, you know, the bus in LA. And so now you're standing next to, uh, you know, Greg Popovich or one of these grips who's been working in this, the business for 30 years. And the first thing he says, rehearsal's up. Let's get it quiet, please. And here you are just off the bus and here's the guy talking next to you. You, you have to ask him to be quiet and you have to get him to be quiet. And that's your job. So you can't be shy about that. And if you're not doing that, then you're going to hear about it from the 80. Guys, I'm hearing talking by Crafty. Get it quiet. So you, have, you can't be shy about, about that. And you know when we're getting ready to rehearse, we've called the actors in. So maybe, you know, start warming these guys up. Hey, guys, wrap up your conversation. We're about to rehearse. And okay, go rehearsing now. Shh, quiet, please, guys. Shh. I wish I got paid by the shush because <laughs> I shush people all the time. So another really important job of a PA is to carry batteries, spare batteries. So that's, you know, you could really distinguish yourself just by doing that, uh, by having a battery. And you hear these walkies, they give an alarm when the battery is going dead. Chirp, chirp. So you should be listening for that and have that walkie in. And especially if it's a first aid, you hear that chirp, chirp, and you're running in and you have that battery ready to go. Wow, cool. All right, you, you know, I'm going to remember this person. Um, so he, he's just saying here that he wants, the first day he wants his battery changed at lunchtime so that he doesn't have to worry about it dying in the middle of an important shot. So usually there's one PA that's assigned to walkie-talkies. That might be one of your first jobs. 
you know, as the walkie PA, not a really fun job, but a way in the door. And if you're the walkie PA, then you want to make sure that your first AD gets a, a fresh battery at lunch. Uh, all staff should have a spare call sheet. You know, these, these are the things that people are going to be asking for. So when you're distributing sides and call sheets in the morning, you want to, you know, have extra call sheets and stuff so that you can hand them out and sides and batteries. Uh, really important, never, never say, I don't know. Never say, I don't know. If somebody asks you something, hey, where's uh, Franco? I don't know. Mm. Hey, uh, you know, we need, did you see that, uh, those pink pages that were coming in? No, no, I didn't see it. It's not a good answer. No, but let me check on that. People all the time ask me stuff that I don't know, constantly. It's, I, I'm, I'm so excited when somebody asks me something that I know the answer to, even now, in, in, in my position now. So people are always asking me stuff that I don't know, but I tell them, no, I'm not sure, but let me find out and I'll get right back to you. And then follow up. Very important. Don't ever say I don't know and always follow up. Even if you know they got the answer some other way and you, you know that, you're cognizant of that. Hey, you know, I know that you found out, but here's what I did and I found out the answer, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, assistant directors should know the script previs sequence better. I'm gonna show you guys what a previs is, is in a second. Don't stand in doorways, common sense. <laughs> Uh, production staff should all see photographs of the cast. That's really important. Hey, I'm looking for, uh, you know, thug number seven, guys. Has anybody seen thug number seven? So you, you know who that is. Maybe go on IMDb. Just do a little bit of legwork so that you become valuable. So that if somebody asks for somebody, you know what they look like. That's your job to walk them in too, right? For yeah. you to find out and see. Good, good advice. Um, and the rest of this stuff is, yeah, we've already gone over some of that stuff. So I know I'm running out of time already, but I want to, uh, let's see here. I want to show you guys really quickly what a previs is. You, anybody heard that term before? It's really cool. It's like a, um, it's like a animated storyboard. And especially on the second units that I've been working on, we've been using them a lot. So here's just one from uh, Die Hard from a couple years ago. And you saw it also in my... Uh, this will end up being frame for frame exactly how the movie looks. And especially in stunts like this where there's visual effects and practical stunts, it gets everybody on the same page. You can see, you know, um, the timing of each shot is down on the lower right. There's a lens size on every frame here, focal 21 millimeter, 17 millimeter. So each shot, so everybody's on the same page. We know exactly where everything is gonna be and where everybody wants to be, and it's just a real good way to get everybody on the same page. And you'll notice that these are more used more and more. And a lot of the movies that I worked on, because they're big stunts and action sequences, we have this. So as a second AD, if somebody asks me to show them the previs and they wanna see a specific shot in it, I need to know exactly where that is so I'm not fumbling through it. So I study these things and I know like where every frame of it is. So if you ever have if you ever have the job of being the one that's wrangling the previs, you want to know exactly where every part of it is in there. So that is what a previs is, and that's the one from uh, Die Hard, the one that I worked on. Um, I will encourage you guys, you know, as you're getting your entry into the business and you're working with, with professionals, to ask questions, but Remember, nobody will listen to you if you don't know when to talk. So there's a time to ask questions. Most people that I know that work in the business are happy to share information, and especially if you're working with us, we want you guys dialed in. But if I'm standing there and obviously distracted by 40 things and you come up to me and ask me a question, that's not the right time. You're not going to get the answer. But, you know, if you see me relaxing for a second, sitting down, hey, do you have time? I have a quick question. Yeah, no problem. So um, your next step up from PA might be a trainee, or you could be a base camp PA. So a lot of the things that you do as a trainee are run base camp. So what that means is you're greeting the actors as they come in. You're making sure that they get the information they need about the day, that they get their sides, that they know what's going on, that they sign their contract if it's their first day, and that they get escorted over to hair and makeup. And you're also working closely with hair and makeup. Hey, you guys ready for Fred? You're ready in five minutes? Okay, I'll bring him over. You wanna really, you know, it's important to have that, uh, a good relationship with them. Because if not, they can make it really hard for you. And it looks bad for you outside in base camp. Meanwhile, the first AD is way inside and he doesn't know that the things that are happening to you out in base camp, all he knows is that Fred, the actor, isn't ready and coming in when, when, it's, when it's necessary. So it's a really important job and there's a lot on your shoulders if you're running base camp. 
but it's really cool because you get to work the most closest, the closely with the actors, closer than anybody. Stand by. Stand by. Uh, what happened to my PowerPoint presentation? Here we go. So I got a chance to uh, run base camp when I was a trainee on some really cool jobs like CSI. And so I had really an opportunity to work really closely with the actors and get have, be, you know, have personal re relationships with them. And this is uh, at the time when this was the number one show on TV. So I can't you know, think of, this is a little guy that was working there, but I can't think of anything that was more exciting than walking through the Venetian uh, casino in Las Vegas with Billy Peterson and Mark Helgenberger when CSI was the number one show in the world and walking through the casino with them, it was extremely exciting. So um, there's a lot of good things. You know, at the same time, you're, you're kind of an outside dog and you wanna be inside on set close to the action, but you're outside in base camp. So it's kind of frustrating, but at the same time, you have access to the actors that uh, nobody else has. This is another show called Boomtown. You guys know who that is? Anybody have a guess? Guess? Where, where would we have seen him? That's Bubba Gump, that's true. Really a good looking, handsome guy without big lips and really knows very little about shrimp as it turns out. <laughs> so this is that same show, Boomtown. That's uh, Donnie Wahlberg, that's right. And then um, as you work closely with the actors, that's Catherine Bell from JAG. That's me with some M16s. As you work, <laughs> as you work closely with the actors, then your parents start to ask you to have them hold up signs for their friends and family. And if you, are, if you have a good relationship with the actors, then they'll do it for you. So that's uh, Edward Cullen there on my left. This is a show called uh, Fast Lane. Right. Mr. Cohen. I don't know, I don't watch Twilight. He's a vampire. That's <laughs> Tiffany Thiessen. I got to work on ER, and I met all these guys. And so it's exciting to run first team, and uh, Bob Newhart, you guys know who that is? Yeah. Old comedian. Funny story, he, he, his, in his story arc, he, he dies, he kills himself, and I asked him, Mr. Newhart, have you ever died before on camera? And he's like, no, but I've died in plenty of comedy clubs. And it was pretty hey, cool. hey -o. <laughs> so um, that was pretty much my experiences as a, as a trainee. Another important thing you do as a trainee is you're gonna do the production report, which is a very important document that kind of, uh, it's, it's a legal document and it tells the production company exactly what was accomplished that day. You know, uh, compared to the call sheet, which says what the plan is, this actually tells you what you accomplished that day. It tells you how much of all of the, of your assets were used. So film, you guys know what film is? It's this brown stuff that goes inside cameras. They don't have it that much anymore. So, um, so these, these will be uh, digital tapes instead. So, uh, and it tells you what the actors times, it tells you extras, and it also tells you uh, all the times of the crew on the back here. So this is your, as a, as a trainee or sometimes a base camp PA, this is a very important part of your job. So, um, then as you move on, your next uh, job is probably gonna be as a, um, oh yeah, really quickly, I just wanna discuss the, the difference between uh, TV and film. It, it, it is, they run parallel to each other, but it is kind of a different world. So just to show you, here's a, uh, a script, a TV script from Castle. And so this is uh, 58 pages, okay? So here's a film script from Night and Day. And so that's 126 pages, okay? So it's only, you know, it's a li uh, maybe about half, but we shoot this in eight days, okay? We shoot this in like three months. So on a, on a TV show, you're shooting, we always, we talk about the amount of pages that we're shooting during a day. So on a, on a TV show, we're shooting, you know, eight pages a day sometimes, six or seven pages of that script a day. And on a, on a film, you're shooting maybe one page a day. So it's a lot different pace. And a lot of people prefer TV because you're moving a lot faster and film could be a lot slower. But also that gives the, the creative people more time to work on, on it. So another difference, and I, I worked on a TV pilot directed by Catherine Bigelow. And so here she comes from Big Features. And on a TV show, the director is not the one who has the juice. On a TV show, the writers have the juice. 
and the producers have the juice and the director is a hired gun. On a TV show, you have a different director almost every episode. There's usually a, a couple main directors that'll do several episodes, but because you shoot TV episodes consecutively, you can't prepare for the next one if you're shooting one because you're very busy. So on a, on a TV show, a, a director's a hired gun and the, and the power is really with the writers. On a film set, the director is God. So just a little difference on those. So then once you move up to second, second AD, so now you're in the guild and now you're in the director's guild and now you're a second, second AD. So now your responsibilities, you're now supervising that person that's out in base camp and you are in charge of all the PAs and you're setting those lockups. So I'm the guy that's saying, hey, I need a lockup over here, I need one over there. And now if a, a non-combatant or a bogey, which is somebody not working in the movie, walks into the shot, now it's my fault because now I've moved up, I'm getting paid more, and now that's my fault. So you have more responsibility. Um, and, the, and then really the cool thing that you do as a second second assistant is uh, you work with the extras a lot and you're setting the extras and you're casting the extras and you're choreographing the extras, which is cool because you can then get your friends and family in the movie as extras. And we'll get to that in just a second. But uh, so my first, uh, my first job out of uh, the training program was Seventh Heaven. And it wasn't what I had in mind. I wanted to work on big movies. And now all of a sudden I'm working on this show about this Christian family. And it's boring. And uh, the hours were actually really short. But I didn't want that at that time. We're going home at like 2 p.m. And everybody else on the crew who's been working in the production for so long was saying, you should really appreciate this. And I was like, no, no, I want to do more exciting things. Now, 12 years later, I'm like, yeah, that was pretty sweet going home at two. But um, it wasn't exactly what I had in mind. And, but it was good for a couple of reasons. And I want to very briefly uh, touch on food on set. Very exciting. You have catering, breakfast, lunch, sometimes dinner. There's always food available. So um, craft service is even separate of that. So you have catering in the morning. You can get eggs Benedict, you can get a bagel, you can get whatever you want, hash brown sandwich, and they'll make it for you at that catering truck. And then they bring in a hot snack three hours later, which even if it's like 10 a.m. could be fried chicken or pizza or something like that. And then three hours later, you have lunch at the caterer. They have this whole huge spread. And then three hours later after that, they bring in a second meal of pizza or something like that. And if you continue working, they'll just keep feeding you. So really good thing about working on a film set. You never go hungry. You can always bring stuff home. And that's exciting. Um, <laughs> and then the real reason that uh, the blow was softened working on Seventh Heaven is uh, this. And I can show you guys this. This is uh, public information. This is the minimum uh, wages of assistant directors in the Directors Guild. So here, um, even as a second second assistant director, for a week on, in the studio, you're looking at this number right there for a week. So that's nothing to sneeze at. And then if you work on location for one week, you're talking about that number right there. And then as you move up, this is my, my minimum rate. And then if you're really good, you can negotiate for overscale. This is scale. They can't pay me less than this, but they can pay me more. So I get that one, and then I get plus this one, which is something called production fee, which I'm not sure what that is, but it's more money, so I like it. <laughs> And then they pay me for my computer on top of that. So the point is, not only is it pretty fun and fulfilling, it's actually really lucrative. It's blood money, I mean, a lot of times for 19 or 21 <laughs> hours, but this really softens the blow. So if you guys do want to pursue the AD department, you know, it might, it's not that bad here in this department. Um, so now let me just get back to uh, working with extras. So um, on a couple different shows I worked on, they really kind of honed my skills Working on extras. Am I running out of time? Yeah, okay. okay, good. We got, we got about 20 minutes to go. All right, cool. Okay. And then questions? Oh, uh, no, that's, that's the 20. Oh, no. That includes, uh, that includes the questions, uh, Larry. All right, I'll try to, I'll try to hurry up. Um, so yeah, working with extras is really fun, and um, it's exciting. And, then, and, and at that point, my work is now on screen, which is really cool. I am a creative person. Like, you know, I'm not a, I don't feel like a director or an artist. Like, if you ask me to paint a picture, I couldn't do that either right now. I just don't, it's not the way that I'm wired. But I, yeah, I'm a very creative person. And so I enjoy the, you know, choreographing the extras. And, you know, you want to make them look real, but you don't want to draw attention from what's happening in the foreground. So it's, it's an interesting to, to learn how to do that. 
And like I said, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to get my family into a couple different movies. And so here's this one particular day on Desperate Housewives. And uh, so it's a Little League baseball scene that we're shooting. And I had arranged ahead of time for my mom and dad to come visit the set. And we're putting all the extras in the stands of the uh, baseball stadium. And it's Felicity Huffman and her husband's kid that's in the baseball game. And so we uh, put all the extras in the stands and I place my mom and dad with the director to make sure that they're gonna be seen. And then the props guys come and they hand out uh, popcorn and drinks. And so you know, you, when you're setting extras, you always want them to be holding stuff. Even if it's a, a police bullpen or a high school hallway, and these are the, or a courtroom, these are like the most common places that we set extras in TV especially. You want to um, make sure that they're holding stuff because it looks real. So the props guys were handing all this stuff out and they handed out uh, pom-poms and foam fingers and all this stuff. And so the first thing we do is a wide shot from the field looking back at the stands and we're recording them with different reactions and um, that we'll use, you know, peppered throughout the scene. And so we have them go crazy. Okay, guys, crazy with your pom-poms and your fingers and cheering and standing. And so we get the shot and we move on and we're gonna go do Felicity Huffman's close-up. And so now she's uh, nominated for an Academy Award that year for Transamerica. And it's a close-up on her face. And I usually run back to the monitors and watch the shot with the director. And that way, if there's any changes that have to be made with the extras, then they'll let me know what those are. So we go back, we, we roll the camera. Felicity's close up, and then all of a sudden you see this big blue finger, foam finger come right in front of her face. And it's my mom who was doing exactly the same thing she had done in the prior shot, but just didn't realize we were doing a close up. So I start running in, <laughs> no! And the director's going, what the f And I run in and I grab the finger, and she's like, what, what? All she had done was the same exact thing on the prior shot. And then Felicity Huffman stands up and goes, that's Katz, his mom. So because they were so sweet and because I had such a great relationship with everybody on set, nobody cared and it was uh, pretty funny. So, so uh, I actually, you know, um, study people and watch, you know, I'll go downtown and just hang out and watch people walking around so that my background looks realistic when I set them into a shot because you really want, I, you know, really want it to look real. And I'll, I can request, okay, you know, if I'm setting a shot in a downtown setting, I want a couple homeless guys. So they'll send me some extras and we'll dress them up like homeless guys. You know, I want a shopping cart. Hey, set dressing, let me get a shopping cart here. And I want it filled with, you know, homeless guy stuff. And as, a, as the AD, I'm the one that paints that picture in conjunction with the director. So it is a chance to be, um, to be creative. Uh, a couple more stories about um, setting extras. I was working on this show, The Mentalist, you know, and we were shooting on Hollywood Boulevard, and it's, uh, you know, we can't shut down Hollywood Boulevard for this TV show. It's tourists, and everybody are walking around, and we're shooting the scene right next to them, and I, we have to get everybody to be quiet. We have some of our extras that are peppered in amongst them, but a lot of, we can't stop the, the regular tourists from coming in, so I got them involved, you know. I'm not gonna yell at them or be mean at them, to them. I want them on my side, and it's important as an AD to have everybody on your side. The crew, the extras, the security guys, the caterer, they need to, to be working with me. I'm not telling them their job. I'm telling them what has to happen and then what time, and then I'm confirming that that's gonna happen. So I want everybody on my side. So if I have these, these um, the people, the tourists on Hollywood Boulevard, and I need them to be quiet, hey guys, I'm Larry. I'd love to have you guys watch our shot. You can even be part of it. But what happens is when the actors come out, we have to be quiet or else it won't work. They won't be able to do their art. You guys want to see them do their art? You want to see, you want to be in the shot? Just work with me and you know, I'm happy to have you guys hang out here. And oh yeah, Larry, and then in between shots, hey, where are you from? Oh yeah, I'm from Detroit, you been in LA long? So you know, really get them on my side. And then when we started rolling the camera, the director, the producers were amazed that everybody was quiet. All these people that were tourists that were, you know, just happened to be walking by were now part of our scene and they were quiet. And then as other people walked up, the people that I had spoke to shushed them for me. And so everybody was on my side and I got, I got invited back to work on that show often. So there's ways that you can get people to do what you want by keeping them on your side. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, I know I'm running out of time, um, is uh, especially when you're running first team and you're dealing with the actors, um, you are going to have people frantically 
talking to you. Oh my God, we need, you know, we need uh, Joe. We need him in this shot right now. He was supposed to be in here before, but we didn't know. So now here's this uh, artist that's in his room and you're running over to that room and you're gonna knock on the door because they need him right now. So you have like two choices. Run to the room. Oh my God, Joe, we need him over there right now. We gotta get you. Come on, we gotta go right now. We gotta go run, run, run. So that is now gonna freak this actor out. So uh, my advice to you guys uh, as an AD, especially running uh, first team, is to be a duck. You ever heard that analogy before? You know, duck on a lake. You look at a duck swimming around, and on the top of the water, that duck is just like, hey, what's up? But underneath the water, those legs are moving furiously, frantically. So you guys should be a duck. If your legs are moving frantically underwater, when you get to that door of that actor, knock. Hey, what's up, man? You know, I'm sorry we needed you in there right now. They, they just called for you, and here's what happened. And just be calm. Nobody wants a panicky person on set. So <laughs> be a duck is my advice to you guys. Um, I have one, one more uh, cool story to tell you guys uh, real quick about um, a cha- an opportunity I got on Pirates of the Caribbean. So I worked on TV for a while, and I wanted to get into the features. And finally, my friend Dave Vangas, a big-time first AD, called me to go work on Pirates of the Caribbean. So as you're working in production, you always need to know, like I told you, what the person is doing that's in the job ahead of you because you might be called upon to do one of their responsibilities. Hey, I need you. I can't, I can't step away right now. I need you to go set the extras. I need you to go work on the production report. So you should always know what the person ahead of you is doing. So I, I got the call to work on Pirates of the Caribbean Part 3, and it's the beginning of the movie when there's this line of hundreds of pirates, and they're all being led to the gallows, and they're all being executed for uh, associating with pirates or uh, being pirates. And so uh, we're shooting in, uh, Palm, in Palmdale or one of these movie ranches a couple hours out of L.A., and I get there at 3 in the morning, which means I had to wake up at 1-something. Again, you know, okay, I'm waking up. Here we go, going to work, no problem. Get there, and I figure my job is to just uh, wrangle these pirates, hundreds of pirates. They have to come in. They have to get dirty. They have to get hair. They have to get wardrobe, and it's a process. You know, that we had a huge, giant tent set up with all these stations where we can get everybody ready, and I figure it's my job to put them through the process. And so I'm looking at these makeup and hair chairs. Okay, you, makeup, you, hair, you go to wardrobe. Over there, what's the problem? You ran out of that? Okay, I'm making it happen, bringing water. And so for hours, this is what I'm doing. And I figure, okay, that's why they brought me in, to take care of these pirates, and I'm fine with that. Then crew call comes, 7 o'clock, and my friend Dave calls me to the set. Larry, I need you up here right away. Okay, so leave the extras and run up to the set. And Dave Vangas says to me, Larry, this is Gore. Gore, Larry. Gore's going to tell you what he wants. This is Gore Verbinski, the director now of the two, up to this point, hugely successful Pirates movies. So... Gore Verbinski takes me over to the storyboards, and there's a a picture, a storyboard with a a flag flapping and on a turret with some smoke going by and a guard standing up there. And he says, you know, this is the shot we need to get, and um, if you will take this B camera and this crew and go over there and, you know, get the shot the way that it is on a storyboard. So I take the camera crew, and I have a special effects guy blowing smoke, and the flag is flapping, and I have a little clamshell recorder and we get the shot, I bring it over to Gore, and he takes a look at it, and he says, it's pretty good, but you know, let's go tweak it a little bit this way or that way. So we run back over, get the shot a couple more times, and bring it back to Gore, and he's happy. And he says, okay, here's what we need now. And it's a picture of a noose with the sun coming behind it. And so he's like, this is the shot we need now. So now I walk up to the grumpy grip that's been in the business for 35 years, and I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I need to set this shot of the news. He's like, oh, is that what you need? Well, I'm over here with the unit. Is that, and now I think that's what they need. And I was like, look, you know, Gore asked me for this. So when you get a chance, I know you're working on that right now, but when you get a chance, so sometimes people just need to bark at you real quick and it's nothing personal. You just gotta get barked at and just <whistles> let it go. So he sends over some of the grips and we build this rig and we put the noose on it with the sun coming through it. Do a couple takes of that, bring it back to Gore. And then finally he's happy with it. And I go back to my day of, wrangling pirates. So cut to uh, a couple months later, the movie is uh, being screened for the cast and crew at the Capitan Theater, and uh, the movie starts, and the very first shot of the movie is the flag flapping with the smoke going by, and the very second shot of the movie after that is the noose with the sun coming through it. So the two shots that I directed, wrangled, were the very first two uh, images of that movie. So- Very cool.